Amen. Can you agree, Summit, that we've had some church today? Woo! We give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. This is what it's all about, coming together as believers, as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, and speaking His name to all creation. That's what it's all about, the celebration and the joy, because we were created to be a joyous people. Amen. Speaking of people, people are very wise. People are brave. People are resilient. People are witty and loving and kind. And people are, well, let's be honest and lay it all out on the table. People can also be really stupid. We don't mean to be. We certainly don't intend to be. But we eventually, we say stupid things. We do stupid things. And we never mean to. But all of those stupid things that we people do and we say, they hurt other people. They hurt ourselves. They invariably cause extreme pain, more often than not of the emotional kind the kind that you and I can't see on the surface of each other, the kind that we try to damp down and tamp down so as not to keep rising up within us every single day. Woundedness. By definition, it is the state of being physically, emotionally, or spiritually injured or harmed. It implies a condition of vulnerability, pain, or suffering resulting from some kind of trauma, loss, or negative experience. And more often than not, we pick up a lot of our woundedness from our formative years and experiences. When we're growing and we're learning and we're exploring the world around us. But there's hard moments in all of that. But even, it can also happen just as easily in these seasons of our lives, the ones that we're in right now, through callous words, dismissive actions, broken relationships, even illness, loss of life, woundedness. And as much as we hope that we aren't the stupid people, because we're human and we're messy, The simple truth is that we aren't going to get it right all of the time. We are going to hurt, and we are going to be hurt. So the question then becomes, what are we going to do about it? Our second child, but our oldest son, Caden, he's 22 now. He's attending, actually, UAF, and he will graduate with a paleontology degree soon, which, honestly, how cool is that? A life of dinosaurs? I'm like, dude, you picked the coolest job. (laughs) But one day, when he was in kindergarten, he came home with really big news. And he came home, and he burst into the house, and he said, Mom, someone said the S word at school today. And I'm thinking, oh, oh no. Okay, here we go. How am I going to handle this? And I'm starting to kind of process, okay, where are we going to go with this? How are we going to handle this well? I'm honestly starting to psych myself out a little bit, wondering if my parenting experience up to this point has really prepared me for the magnitude of this conversation. So this seems like an important moment, and I want to get it right. I feel like, okay, everything is writing on this. This is going to set the stage for how I parent for the next 30 years. Yeah, I also don't, like, you know, take things over the top either. So I'm mentally, you know, I'm putting on the boxing gloves. I'm like, I'm jogging in place, you know. I'm getting ready to step into the ring of parenting in the big stuff. When he leans close to me, and he looks both ways to make sure no one else is listening, and then he stays in a stage whisper, yeah, mom, you know, somebody said, he looks, somebody said, stupid. 
And I thought, oh, I can handle this. I took a big breath of relief, and we talked about how that word is unkind and just not a word that we are going to use in our family. But after that, the S word did officially become stupid in our house. And today, if you ask my 22-year-old what the S word is, he will tell you, it's stupid. But unfortunately, sometimes that S word is what we people are. And it's therefore the inspiration for today's message title, because we are continuing our series this month. Today, our title is called How Not to Be Stupid, part four, and it's just not fair, the life of Joseph. Before we go any further, though, I do want to stop for just a minute. If this is your first time in person here at Summit today, welcome. We are so glad you are here. You picked a great Sunday to come. Yes. We invite you to scan the QR code. There's some on the seat backs in front of you. Let us know you are our guest today because we want to honor you. We have a gift for you. We would like to thank you for coming. And if this is your first Sunday, we are going to ask that you give us here at Summit three Sundays. Give us three Sundays to get to know us, to get to meet the Summit team, to learn about life at Summit. We really believe that if you do that, you are going to find your family here. Building families. It's what we have been called to do here in North Pole. And we are honored to build families with you. And for those of you who are watching online, because we are streaming right now, we welcome you. The House of Summit welcomes you online. We invite you to share a comment and let us know where you're watching from. So now, as we get ready to dig into the message, would you please pray with me as we get into the word? Lord, we come before you today as the body of Christ. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are our comfort, Lord. You are our friend, our peace, and our joy. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the moments that we've messed up, when we've tried to do things our own way, when we've hurt other people, because we've made decisions that haven't honored you. We ask that you heal every hurt, Lord, and bring new life to the wasteland. We come before you with praise, with thankfulness for every prayer answered, for every win, for every moment where we've seen you move. Thank you for new life and baptism today, Lord, right here at Summit Church, Lord. Together we celebrate here on earth just as we know you and the angels are celebrating in heaven. And Lord, we pray this in the mighty, the beautiful, and the victorious name of Jesus Christ. And together the church said, amen. Amen. I love it. Let's recap quickly the story of Joseph. The Joseph from Genesis with the coat of many colors. And a few weeks ago, we began our deep dive, because we are. We are deep diving into Joseph's story when he was 17 years of age when he was gifted the coat by his father, but then sold into slavery by his very own brothers in what we know is a rash decision born out of jealousy and rage. And from that part of his story, we explored what it means when we are anointed and we are appointed by our Heavenly Father. When we walk with boldness in the gifts that he has given us, keeping the appointments faithfully day by day that he has set before us to increase our kingdom. Even when how we may be treated is, in a nutshell, just not fair. We then followed Joseph's story for the 11 years as he served in Potiphar's house before being accused of a crime that he did not commit by Potiphar's wife, and his reputation we see in Scripture is mutilated and discarded. Yet through Joseph, we understand that reputation is fleeting, and it pales next to the true gift, our strength of character. And through this part of Joseph's story, we have the opportunity to ask the important questions. Who are we? Who will we be when our character is tested? And more, most importantly, who is God? For it is his character upon which we depend. And last week, we found Joseph in prison. 
where through the power of God, he interpreted the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer, asking the cupbearer to remember him when the cupbearer is ultimately released by Pharaoh. Yet for the next two years, we know that Joseph remains forgotten. He languishes in prison. But it's here that Joseph's story reminds us that the plan, God's plan, is still in place. And while we're in the waiting, God is giving us his gifts, those of protection, those of influence, those of his faithfulness, and that of his peace. We concluded last week as Joseph is released from prison with a re- by a request from Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And Joseph does that. Pharaoh's dreams are a vision of what is to come for Egypt, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Now following Joseph's interpretation of the dreams, Pharaoh places Joseph, a man who was once a slave, as his second in command more powerful than everyone in Egypt, with the one exception of Pharaoh himself. The elevation from a slave to a second that is only possible with God. And as God revealed through Joseph, Egypt does experience seven years of plenty. And we know on a personal side, Joseph marries during this time, and he has two sons. But before long, the seven years of famine began, just as God said that they would. At this point, Joseph is 37 years old, right around there. But that means that he hasn't seen his brothers in 20 years. But that is about to change. Because here's where we now pick up Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 42. And what I particularly love about this portion of Joseph's story is that we get the opportunity to see his humanness. Out of everything he's experienced thus far, being torn from his family, slavery, false accusations, prison, he has remained steadfast. Not once has Joseph wavered. And this part of the story, when he sees his brothers again after 20 years, this is where we find Joseph's fallibility. Because we find Joseph's deep, deep woundedness. Out of everything in his life, it is this hurt, this familial hurt, with which Joseph struggles And he falters. This incredible man of God who has weathered so much, it is a wounded heart that brings him, as we will soon see, to tears. And this part of Joseph's story, I love it. Even in the hurt and the heartache, I love it because it shows how seriously God approaches our woundedness. It matters to him, even more than it matters to us, as hard as that can be to believe sometimes when we're in the middle of it. But by including this part of Joseph's story, by allowing Joseph to show his vulnerability to the rest of history, God gives our woundedness voice. But he doesn't leave it there. He also gives us grace. And through him, the strength to walk into healing. How do we know? We know because it's possible right here in Joseph's story. We know that the famine has impacted not only Egypt, but we read in Scripture at this point that the famine was severe throughout the world. That extends all the way to Canaan, where Joseph's father Jacob and his brothers live. And Jacob, Joseph's father, hears that grain is available in Egypt. And he instructs his sons, all ten of Joseph's older brothers, all of whom have their own families at this point, to travel to Egypt to buy grain. However, by this time, another brother has been born. He won't send Benjamin, his youngest son, and Joseph's younger brother, because Jacob fears for Benjamin's safety. So the brothers, we find them traveling to Egypt. 
Let's read a couple of verses. Genesis 42, verses 6, 7, and 8. We're going to read those together. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Do you remember that from the dreams when he was 17? He dreamt that his brothers would bow before him. It has come to pass. They bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. It has been 20 years, but he knows that these men are his brothers. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. And there's a note here in Scripture, verse 8. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. I think it's very interesting to note out here that Joseph's response is immediate to his brothers. He recognized his brothers immediately. We know that. And Joseph makes a quick decision. Right there. He didn't even have to think about it. He decided to be a stranger to them, speaking harshly to them. Because his decision was made so quickly. I believe that this anger that Joseph exhibits for the first time in his story, because remember, he has not spoken this way, behaved this way in all of the years in his story up to this point. But here he is exhibiting this anger for the first time. It's an anger he's been holding on to for many, many years. Not towards the world, but very specifically towards his brothers. It is a wounded from childhood. It is a deep, raw wound. And when they come face to face, we see that the anger from Joseph comes immediately. Why do we think that happened? Because Joseph is comfortable with the anger. He's been carrying it for so many years, it's become a familiar friend. He didn't have to dredge up that emotion in the moment because it was already there. We have to choose, church, we have to choose to allow ourselves to heal. Because we can be so tempted to hold on so tight to our woundedness because it's familiar. And we humans, we're creatures of habit. We like what we like. We like what's familiar because we like what's comfortable. And when woundedness runs so deep, it is an old, comfortable, threadbare blanket. You know the ones that we've all had and we just can't bear to get rid of because it doesn't really work to keep us warm anymore, but we hold onto it with this ironclad grip just because we've simply had it for so long. Woundedness. It creeps beneath the surface and burrows down into the layers of our soul. It is wrenching and crushing and so often begins to impact how we think, how we perceive, how we react to the world and the people around us. It impacts what we think of ourselves. It impacts what we think of our Jesus. So what do we do with these wounds that wrap themselves around our heart, our minds, our lives? How do we begin to heal? This is such a big and so important topic. And we don't want to trivialize it today by assuming that we can tackle every single piece of this very intricate and authentic facet of life today in this time that we have. But we do, however, want to begin the conversation because that's where we start. We start, as in all things, with that first step of courage forward. We want to begin to the conversation. We want to anchor this conversation to some Monday morning takeaways. 
those takeaways we can grab onto as we continue, or for some of us in some areas of our lives, it's true for all of us, even begin, take that first step to our journey of wholeness. I encourage you, whether this is your first week or you've been here for years, to invite you to write down these Monday morning takeaways. Because these are the tangible markers to hold on to when we're no longer in this place right here and Monday has hit. And we need a shot in the arm, a reminder of who we are in Jesus Christ. In 2021, a survey found that 83% of responders agreed that starting the week off healthy helps maintain a focus on health for the rest of the week. That starting with a positive attitude on Monday keeps them on track for the next six days. Okay, church, we're going to hold on to that tomorrow morning. We're going to be like, okay, I am doing this right now because I am speaking life over my next six days. That is what we're doing. And coffee helps. Or in my case, hot chocolate. Which you can drink when it's 90 degrees out. Now, I do love that 83% is a great place to start. Like, I love that 83% of the world says, yes, let's start a good habit on Monday. We can do it. We can keep this up. But honestly, church, 83% is not good enough. Our Jesus does not operate in just good enough. Church, we're going for the whole 100%. That's what we believe. That's who we believe our Jesus is. We are believing that for 100% of the people, 100% of the time, because we know who our Jesus is, we are holding on to hope and health and future and victory and promise every single minute of every single day. Because that's who our Jesus is. Because church, he is big enough. We're going to hold on to these Monday morning takeaways. The world needs the Jesus that we know. The Jesus who is greater than any hurt and any wound. We see the wounds in Joseph. We see him in his story. We see the wounds in ourselves. It's deep and it's layered. And these wounds are not going to be solved in a day. And that is okay. But we simply begin. So in our story, the brothers are here. And Joseph has angrily and immediately accused them of spying, which they deny. And he accuses them again. Once again, they deny it, saying, no, you don't understand. There are 12 brothers, although one is at home with our father, and one has been lost to us. Because, of course, we know that they do not know they are talking to Joseph. Joseph responds that he will keep nine of the brothers in prison, sending just one brother to go and retrieve Benjamin, who we know as the youngest brother. And Joseph tells him, you need to bring Benjamin back to me. Joseph says that only then will I know that you are not spies. He then puts all ten of his brothers in prison for three days. Now, can we imagine what Joseph is feeling in these three days. We know his woundedness. And now his brothers are here, and he is face to face with 20 years of his past. I think he knew from his own story that his father, Jacob, would never send Benjamin to Egypt. And even in Scripture, we see that Jacob does not want to send Benjamin to Egypt. I think that Joseph, in his humanness, in his woundedness, in that raw place, felt that this, putting his brothers in prison and Benjamin not coming and the nine remaining, 
he felt that this would be acceptable retribution for the woundedness of his childhood inflicted at the hands of his brothers. But God. God gives us three, here's where we start promises. That's what we're going to call them. Here's where we start promises. As we heal, that we are going to hold on to as our Monday morning takeaways. Because church, we are going to heal. Whatever woundedness is in our soul, our spirit, our mind, our heart, our body, church, that is not for tomorrow. It is not even for today. Because our God is the great physician. He is the healer. As we will see here in a moment, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Our God is bigger than the brokenness in our life today. And we stand on his promise for healing and hope. Because here's our promise, number one, and we see this in the story of Joseph. As we are healing, God will heal our memories. Memories are a powerful thing. Our memories influence how we perceive the world around us. We see it in Joseph's story, how he responded to our brothers. Our memories influence how we respond to new situations, how we perceive ourselves, how we react to others. We see it right here in Joseph's story. And I think if you and I think for a moment, we in our own stories... We think of those memories that have caused those hurt and those wounds. And still, when we think about it, there's still a little bit of a fester there. But the truth is, God has given his promise that there is hope for more. He gave it to Joseph. We're going to see it in Joseph's story, and he gives it to us. This is the verse I mentioned earlier, Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That is a promise. What does it mean to bind up our wounds? It means to close them to seal what has been torn apart, to redeem what has been lost, to heal the pain of the memory. I really went back and forth between whether I was going to share what I'm about to share, and I feel like God says, go. So I'm going to share. Because there was a memory in my life that I struggled to get past. And it just hurt. And it was raw. And it impacted how I saw myself and how I saw people around me. And I will tell you that there are only five people in this world who know what I'm about to share. But I am going to share it today Because I am a living, walking, breathing testimony that God will heal our memories. When I was 14 years old, I was raped. Not just once. Not by a family member, but by someone I did know. Over the course of about three months, repeatedly, over and over again. And I was so ashamed. There was so much shame in my life. And I had guilt because I thought I put myself in that situation. And for years into my marriage, into having children, like even now my heart is actually pounding. It's a good thing you can't see it. I look like a cartoon character. I would get just tense, and I would get nervous and shy, and I would withdraw into myself if anything began to make me nervous or fearful or uncomfortable, and I began to draw away from having relationships with people because people hurt. And I began to go before my Heavenly Father, and I said, Lord, 
I don't want to live with this memory. Every time, Lord, just tears, and it's just raw, and it's open, and it's vulnerable. And Lord, it just hurts. And over the period of time, God began to heal those memories. Now, I can look back, and I know it happened. And I can look back, and I can see now how God, he didn't, it didn't happen. God didn't have anything to do with why it happened. But he took what happened and uses all things for his good and for his glory. And honestly, church, if his good and his glory is me saying it today and it making a difference for someone in this big, wide world, then that is enough. Because I stand here and God has healed those memories. I cry because it's emotional for me to tell the story. I feel the presence of God just over me right now. Comfort and hope. That's why I cry. I always cry when Jesus is in the house. He gave me the gift of tears. But I, when those memories come up, because sometimes they do, something will jog my memory. They don't come back with hurt or rawness, or pain. Church, they come back with the beautiful conviction that God has redeemed and restored my story. And I am a living, walking testimony of who he is and who he will be forevermore. Our God. He heals our memories. We see this healing in Joseph's story too. On the third day, Joseph goes to the prison. And we see instead of releasing over one, only one brother, as he originally said he would do, he releases nine, leaving only one in prison. And not only that, he says they will be given the grain they requested to take home to their starving families. And that upon the arrival of Benjamin, the youngest brother in Egypt, when he comes, there will be proof enough that they are telling the truth. This is a huge turnaround for Joseph. He rescinds his initial punishment. He chooses to release his brothers as they did not do for him all those years ago. He chooses to send food to their families, which he initially refused to do. Because God used those three days, excuse me, those three days to redeem, to restore, and to heal Joseph's memories. God gives us the space to change our course, to heal from our past, and to walk with confidence to our future. Now, after Joseph releases the nine from prison, keeping only Simeon, before they leave to return to Canaan to retrieve Benjamin, he hears them talking amongst themselves. And he hears Reuben say to the other brothers, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. And they didn't know that Joseph understood them, for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Verse 24, now he turned away from them and began to weep. And I find this so interesting as well. In all of Joseph's story, this is the first time that he cried. Now when he was sold into slavery, not when he was accused of a crime, not when he was thrown into prison for two years, but when he heard his brother's remorse of their treatment of him all those years ago. And Reuben's defense of him, he began to weep because he was moved to forgiveness. 
And that's our second takeaway from today. God will heal our priorities. And in him, we will desire to prioritize forgiveness. Joseph didn't start his day planning to forgive his brothers. We can see that clearly by his treatment of them in the beginning of the story. Yet, God softened his heart and he was moved to tears. I love this. It's so encouraging because we know that God doesn't change his mind. He is immutable, but we can change ours. In his strength, when we drift off course, we can shift right back. And as God heals our priorities, as he changes our course from one of destruction to one of restoration, we discover, it comes as a big surprise. I know this from firsthand experience. We discover a desire to forgive. Yes, even for those who have hurt us. And it can take some time. And that's okay. It's a process doesn't always happen overnight. But the good news is God is not asking for perfection, just progress. How do we forgive? Real quick. We say, Lord, I choose to forgive this person. It's a decision that I am making. Even if I don't feel it, I am choosing it. Number two, I ask you to bless this person. Lord, bless them with your love, with your patience, with your gift of grace, with your healing and your restoration in their life. And number three, I release this person to you. Because what does that say? I'm not going to try to be in charge anymore, God. They are your son. They are your daughter. It's not my plan, God, but it's yours. And Lord Jesus, I release this person to you. And the beautiful thing is, as we release that individual, we are released as well. Joseph puts his forgiveness into practice, not only filling his brother's snacks with grain for the trip home, but also instructing his servants to return each brother's payment for the grain, placing it in the top of each sack. As we close, we're going to skip ahead just a few verses. And now the brothers, they have returned. Jacob has allowed Benjamin to come by the grace of God, and Benjamin has come to Egypt. And Joseph has walked through this process of healing, and through the grace of God, he is able to respond very differently than he did the first time. Because we see in Scripture that Joseph welcomes his brothers with kind hospitality, and they still don't know who he is. Simeon is released from prison. All 11 brothers are welcomed into Joseph's home, given water to wash their feet, food for their donkeys, and themselves with Scripture saying, Joseph fills their plate with food from his own table. And this is our third takeaway on our road to wholeness. And this is number three. God will heal the desire for vindication. This blows my mind. Joseph here in Scripture, he hasn't said a word. Not a word. He is serving his brothers. He has not shared who he is. The brothers do not know that this is Joseph. And But yet we can see from his actions that Joseph... Joseph is at peace. He doesn't need the brothers to ask for his forgiveness. He doesn't need the brothers to sit in jail as retribution. He doesn't need them to acknowledge to him what they've done. At this point in the story, he doesn't even need them to know that he is their brother. He simply rests in the heavenly redemption of his no longer wounded heart. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Amen. 
That's a lot of freedom right there, church. We don't have to shout from the rooftops. We don't have to plead our case. We don't have to hold others accountable. We don't have to fight for what we determine is our due when we are wounded. Why? Because the Lord is already in the battle. We come before him in prayer. We come before him in authenticity and transparency. We come before him in all of our human mess. And he will fight on our behalf. It's another one of those 6,000 promises. We will be healed. But God, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope, our promise, our future, and our healer. If you're walking through woundedness, we'd like to take just a moment to pray over you. We want to pray healing over your heart, your mind, your spirit. God will heal the memories. God will heal our priorities. God will give us the desire to prioritize, to put first our forgiveness of those who hurt us. God will heal the desire for vindication. We do not have to fight our battles. Our Lord is fighting for us. And we get to worship, church. We get to praise. We get to bask in the presence of our most high God. What a beautiful gift. What a gracious heavenly father. What an honor that that is. Would you pray with me, church? Lord, we come before you today. Lord, we lift up every heart. Lord Jesus, we lift up every wound, every raw pain. Lord, all the layers, we just lay them at your feet. Lord, we don't want to hold on to this woundedness anymore. Lord, you are our great physician. You are our healer. You are our heavenly father. You have the plan, and you have the purpose, and you have the healing for our hurting heart. Lord Jesus, we want to be authentic before you. We don't want to try to think like we're hiding anything from you. We just want to come before you in all of our human mess and lay it at your feet and say, Lord, I hurt. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to process this. But, Lord, I give it to you. And, Lord, you are so faithful. And you are so good. And, Lord, even now, you are working healing in every life, every heart, every situation, and every moment, Lord. Lord, we stand on your promise, Lord. We believe in your healing of our heart and our memories, Lord. We believe, Lord, in your desire to forgive those who have hurt us, whether it was intentional or not, Lord. We come before you and we say, Lord, we choose, and not in our strength, but in yours to forgive. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We are not here to fight our own battles, Lord, but to give ourselves wholly and completely over to you. Lord Jesus, we have only to be still and silent in your presence, and you fight on our behalf. Lord, what an amazing God you are. We lift your name. We lift your name before the heavens, Lord. We speak your praises. We speak who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you have created in us a people of hope, a people of healing, a people of promise and restoration, a people of victory, Lord. And, Lord, we stand on that promise today. 
We claim that promise and we hold on, Lord, with both hands. Because, Lord, you have never failed us yet and you are not about to start now. And, Lord... For those of us who don't yet have a personal relationship with you, today is the day. Lord, we invite you into our heart, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive us for trying to make our own way, our own path, Lord. Make our heart a home that is pleasing to you. Infuse us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit that we might learn from you and become more like you and live as people of light. Thank you, Lord, for who you are today, tomorrow, and forevermore in the mighty, beautiful, and victorious name of Jesus Christ. Together, the church said, amen and amen. Amen. amen.